Hello and welcome to Fast Forwarding the Race to Zero Emission Tracking. My name is Monica Araya and I am the transport lead at Climate Champions. We know we have a fantastic challenge ahead of us when it comes to freight because the demand for road freight is going to triple between now and 2050. And in that period, we know we have to decarbonize that sector entirely. So we have a fantastic session today, and here is a visual summary of the variety of views we are going to share. We're going to hear from different parts of the value of the value chain. We're going to hear from companies that are already doing their job, and we're going to hear about what is needed in order to go bigger and faster. So we will start with a perspective from companies such as Unilever, Scania, and DHL, and then we're going to hear from financiers and infrastructure, and then we'll close up with remarks from CalStar and from WEF. In order to get started, we are going to now switch to a scene seater that is going to come from the great group ICCT. And before we do that, let me make sure that uh, I emphasize something, I mentioned race to zero, so we don't have time to waste for the race to zero emissions uh, challenge, but we don't have time to waste in this session. It's short, and therefore we won't have time for Q&A. Therefore, I invite you to join the conversation. If you can see it in the screen, you can join through Slido, send some remarks there, you can scan the QR code, and toward the end, there is a, an important question we want to ask you, and we would really want to hear from you. So let's just give a few seconds so that you scan it. And when we are ready to go, we are going to start with ICCT and this great Vision 2050 paper that I encourage you to go and read is fantastic. Rachel, welcome. Tell us who you are and, and let's get started. Hi, thank you so much uh, for the introduction and for having me. I'm Rachel Mungrief. I'm the deputy director at the ICCT, and I'd really like to just help set the stage for today's conversation um, by first introducing you to um, some results from a new report that ICCT recently put out that really looks at what level of reductions are needed from the entire global transport sector in order to meet climate goals. So for this exercise, um, we looked at what's the 2050 greenhouse gas target should be uh, for the transportation sector in order to, um, for the transport sector to sort of do its um, share towards the goal of limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees C this century. Uh, and the answer is by 2050, we need approximately 78% reduction from the levels that we're at today. So if you look at this figure, um, the, the yellow bars on the left, uh, or what Monica mentioned, you know, we project that there, we're still growing um, over the next 30 years in light duty, heavy duty, aviation, marine, et cetera. And then the bars on the right really show where we project the needed reductions can come from. Um, so the bars on the right really represent what we ICCT sort of think is feasible um, under an ambitious policy framework uh, over the next 30 years, really given everything that we know about um, the current and projected technology developments, as well as what the potential for policy is able to, to drive. Um, I really want to note that when we developed our conclusions for what's possible, we really had to keep in mind this balance between improving efficiency of, of conventional vehicles, because we know that a lot more conventional vehicles are going to be sold under pretty much any scenario. But then we also had to look at um, ramp, ramping up the market penetration of zero emission vehicles, because we also know that that's really what's needed to reach sort of the end point of a decarbonized transport sector. So for heavy duty, over the next 30 years, it, it comes out to almost a fairly equal combination of both efficiency and zero emission technologies to reach this target. Of course, this session is really focused on accelerating the zero emission piece. Um, and, you know, heavy duty electrification, especially for the long haul sector, um, is definitely in the earlier stages compared to the passenger cars. But we really see, especially over the last few years, the pace of development really has the potential to progress quite quickly, um, although there are certainly some barriers that we have to overcome. Um, we've spent a lot of time like looking and trying to understand more in depth these barriers. Um, one barrier is availability, um, but we do see availability of zero emission trucks increasing quite rapidly, 
although the long haul segment is still lacking in that area. Um, the next is cost parity. I mean, cost parity is going to be necessary. And we do see with the right drivers in place, cost parity, even for the long haul sector could come in the 2025 to 2030 um, timeframe. And then the third one is of course, infrastructure. So infrastructure costs we found for zero emission trucking, it's significant, but we can't, we have found that it's not something that's gonna fundamentally impede the viability of zero emission trucks. So th that looks good. Um, and then we look at what's needed to overcome these barriers. And we see that there's three key pieces really needed to drive the transition in the heavy duty sector. One is policy. Um, so we really need technically sound policies, um, new vehicle regulations to drive the efficiency and the increased electrification in the fleet. The second is well-designed incentives. Um, really fiscal incentives and played an integral role in spurring on electric vehicle sales in the light duty sector. And we believe that's also really needed uh, in heavy duty. And then the third is investments, targeted investments. So we really feel like, especially for infrastructure, the transition um, to electric vehicles will really require um, strategic investment and convenient and reliable um, charging infrastructure network. So I just talked a little bit about targets, barriers and, and measures um, to accelerate the transition um, on the heavy duty side. And I hope that can set the stage for the conversation to come in this session. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Rachel. It's very good to hear there is a pathway. And I'm also very happy to introduce our next speaker. She is going to inspire us. She does a lot of work already in this space. This is the Minister of Environment of the Netherlands. I am actually in Amsterdam, so I'm very welcome. I'm very happy to welcome her. She's also the chair of the Transportation Decarbonization Alliance, as we know, TDA. Welcome, Minister Stintje van Velhoven. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. And um... I must say, I, I fully respect the fact that you have uh, been able to pronounce my first name because my parents didn't really envisage for me to have an international career with this kind of an impronounceable name. So uh, compliments to you. And uh, thank you for the opportunity so, to offer some opening remarks. First of all, of course, I hope everybody is healthy. Uh, I had a test myself a couple of days ago. Uh, unfortunately, it was a negative test. And I think the first time I was ever happy to have a negative test outcome. Um, but I think this only underlines for all of us on a daily basis how we are in the middle of a health crisis. All watching the race for a good vaccine for COVID-19 and hoping for a good result. Uh, today we are here for another race, the race to zero emission trucking. And what a meaningful race that is too. Only 4% of on-road fleet are trucks, but they cause over 60% of freight transport CO2 emissions. And if you look at the projections, they could double by 2050 due to continued growth in freight demand. So zero emission commercial vehicles are really key to curbing increasing freight emissions. And it has so many more benefits. Think about improving urban air quality and thus the health of so many people. In the Netherlands, one in five children that suffers from asthma has this disease because of air pollution. So this only underlines the role that we can play in the life of so many children if we improve air quality, we improve their life. And for this, zero emission trucking really is a very important factor. It is my ambition to keep the importance of freight high on the political agenda, given the great potential for and the benefits of doing this. And a lot is happening. I'm really happy to see that the topic is gaining so much traction. We've had a fruitful series of events and workshops. We're happy to see this increasing collaboration with the World Economic Forum, Road Freight Zero, going forward as well. Yet more is needed because we're still not on track. All current projections suggest that not enough zero emission freight vehicles will be on the road by 2030 or 2050. And if you think about the average age of retirement of a freight vehicle being 10 to 15 years, we really need to speed up because if we want all vehicles on the road to be zero emission by 2050, we really need to finish by 2030, 2040. So that's, that we've got a very tight schedule. My ambition would be that countries, cities and companies work together to ensure that zero emission freight vehicles represent at least 30% of sales 
by 2030. I think we need to set ourselves a very clear target. 30% of sales by 2030 and 100% by 2050 at the latest. For Europe and other front-running regions, these targets, I think, should even be higher. This will provide a clear market signal. I think that is what the importance of these targets is. It's a clear signal for all parties involved because we are too often involved with a chicken and egg problem where everybody is waiting for somebody else. We need to provide, as politicians, uh, and I think that's what Rachel just said, we need sound policies, clear policies, the clear market signals uh, to all parties, producers, buyers, cities, planners, utilities. This is a key to break this apparent deadlock and, and which leads to a lo too low pace in the transition. If we move together, we can all move faster and further. We're all holding a piece of the puzzle. Above all, the transition to zero emission trucks is not just about replacing the vehicle, because it really needs a systemic change. If we get the vehicles on the road, we need to charge them. So we need information, understanding of how many will be driving and where and how to optimize the charging infrastructure. That will be crucial for city planners and utilities to timely build the right infrastructure and for governments to coordinate these efforts. So all players need to do their bit in speeding up the systemic change. And I think there are five crucial elements that I'd briefly like to highlight. First, governments, they can create the necessary frameworks and policies and incentives like California, for example, has done. The sales requirements for trucks that California has announced, they are major best practice. And I'm looking forward to hearing more later from my colleagues. And I hope it will inspire all of us to follow suit and that it will inspire the rest of the US too to follow suit. Uh, fleet owners and retailers, we need demand signals by both fleet owners, operators and retailers. Signals including ambitious purchase commitments for vans and trucks and green strategies. Retailers really have the power to influence fleet owners and others to move forward to on zero emission trucks. Don't wait for a silver bullet because there is no. Start with actual solutions. Start with what you can do today. Manufacturers, this is your future. The future is going to be zero emission. So share new models and set hefty production targets. Get these trucks on the road with far more emission and speed than currently on display. This is where your growth should be coming from. And then of course, zoning and charging infrastructure. Getting the charging infrastructure in place is pivotal. But from a policy perspective, if you let me know that you've got great ambitions, it's more interesting for me as a politician to say that I will start investing in the zoning and charging infrastructure. So we need each other. As a front runner in charging infrastructure, I can tell you about this. For freight, it's a different ball game, but we can still win this together. Cities setting zero emission uh, zones is a powerful lever for this transition. We are installing about 40 to 50 zero emission inner city zones in the Netherlands, and we can only do that because we do it jointly. And I would love to see a large coalition of cities present their ambition on this at the COP26, which include freight not just passenger transport. With freight, there's so much that we can do. And actually in the Netherlands, we are moving further and faster on freight than we are on passenger vehicles. And then of course, getting the economics right, investments and new business models. These are necessary to make the zero options financially competitive and feasible, given the upfront investment costs. We can and should jointly make this happen. In less than three weeks, during the en route to COP26, we will build on the outcomes of the conversations here today. And by the time the climate negotiations take place next November, we need to have the peace puzzles solved. It's not the future, it is the present. And for us to drive now and make the best of this race to zero emission trucking. In the end, we are all winners if we cooperate. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And it's, it's very important that we keep repeating what you just said. Don't wait for the silver bullet, winning together and new business models. This is very much what we are going to, to talk about in this session. And I understand that you will stay for, for a few minutes. So hopefully you will get to, to, to hear some of the, the speakers that are coming next because we're gonna hear from a global forwarder. We're going to hear from a retailer and we're also going to hear from an OEM. So let's get started with the next speaker, Ashish Yoshi from Unilever. Ashish, please tell us who you are, what you do, and let's start thinking about what part of the puzzle 
you're trying to solve in this in the context of this winning together that the minister uh, mentioned. The floor is sure. yours. Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Monica. And thank you to, to allowing me to share what we are trying to do in Unilever. And it was great to hear from, from uh, Madam Minister as well as Rachel earlier. And I think I'm going to I'm going to try, uh, I'm going to talk a lot about what they've already spoken. So there is a, already a, a lot of uh, commonality that I could find, which is great. Um, just to start, um, sustainability is at, is at heart of a business. Uh, the purpose of Unilever is to make sustainable living commonplace. So it's not just a uh, good to do activity for us. It is indeed our business strategy. So that is something which is very important because everything starts from there. Um, we always believed in sustainability from the time the company was established, but in 2010, our then CEO, Mr. Paul Pullman, actually announced an ambitious Unilever Sustainable Living Plan, uh, where we had said that we would uh, half our environmental footprint while doubling our business in the next 10 years, uh, which is 2020. And I'm happy to uh, note that we, we, have, we are achieving on, on that uh, promise. Um, in logistics, it also meant that we reduced our emissions uh, till the end of 2019 by 41%, and we are uh, on track to do another 2 or 3% reduction this year. Uh, so that's been going on. Uh, we reset our best base now. Into, in, uh, in, in June earlier this year, our CEO, Mr. Paul, uh, Mr. Alan Jope, has already made a commitment uh, that we would achieve net zero emissions uh, as an organization by 2039. Um, we've broken that target into a decade. So by 2030, we are committing ourselves to reduce our emissions by 50%, uh, which includes logistics as well. So that's the piece that uh, that I am currently focused on in uh, in making sure that this decade, uh, up to 2030, we reduce by 50%. Um, the last seven, eight years uh, journey has taught us a lot of things. Uh, we have done some things right. Uh, a lot of our emission reduction has come out of uh, operational efficiency uh, improvement projects. Uh, whether it's about reducing kilometers traveled or improving utilization of our vehicles and also switching to cleaner alternatives. Uh, and that's the space which we want to continue to work on. Uh, however, just a quick uh, numbers, uh, uh, our current carbon footprint, our emissions footprint, 80% of that comes from road and 8% uh, and comes from ocean. So between these two modes, that's the biggest area for us to focus on. Um, as I said, operational efficiency remains important. So reducing kilometers traveled, getting more efficient in reducing the empty kilometers as well is important for us and will remain always important. Intermodal solutions is an important play for us as well, uh, because close to 20% of our emissions are on lanes which are more than 1000 kilometers. Uh, so how do we switch uh, away from the road into rail or other modes which are cleaner is an important element. Uh, then as the uh, minister also spoke about that um, while we need solutions for heavy duty, long haul transportation, zero emission vehicles, uh, and it, it is not immediately available commercially, uh, but we are not waiting for, for a silver bullet. So we are saying that, yes, we, we are very much interested and we are very committed to move to zero emission technologies, especially on heavy duty, long haul transportation. But more importantly, in the medium term, we are still, we are also focusing on alternate fuels, biofuels in particular. Uh, so that we, we don't wait for a commercial viability and we start to make uh, an impact now. Uh, cold chain will remain important for us. We have a beautiful, uh, a lovely ice cream business. I hope all of you have enjoyed a Magnum or, or a Ben & Jerry's. Um, but it also um, emits uh, close to 16% of total emissions come from ice cream. So we have a specific focus on ice cream cold chain. So liquid nitrogen technologies and all those solutions we are looking at. Last mile solutions, city logistics is another important aspect. Um, London already where I'm sitting right now is, is there is an ultra low emission zone. Uh, city of Hamburg has banned diesel trucks in many other cities. So that's an area for us to partner with our customers and, and work on that. Uh, last point from me, because I have very short time. Um, it's important that I, I, we realize that we cannot do all, all of this alone. We will have to take the entire ecosystem with us. And this is something which we are trying to do while creating a project called Diesel Free France, uh, where we are looking to get off diesel completely in next two years time. And we have already started to partner with not just the 3PL and transport providers, but the entire ecosystem, starting with uh, with OEMs, fuel suppliers, other shippers and customers. And we believe this is the way forward. We all have to come together and we have to really put our best efforts in achieving these uh, targets. So yeah, that's pretty much from my side, looking forward to the rest of the conversation. Thank you, Monica. Thank you. And it builds really well uh, on what Rachel told us. So because we need to improve from a perspective of operations, but it's not enough. We have to go all the way to zero. 
So net zero by 2030 already sets the tone for others in your sector. And we will make sure we benchmark others. Uh, so congratulations for setting that ambitious target. Let's now hear from a global forwarder, a global forwarding company. That's, that's very interesting. So let's welcome Catherine Bross from DHL. Tell us what you do and let's build on, on what we have been discussing so far. Yeah, thank Lord you so George. much. Thank you for my, so much for having me. I, I today represent the Deutsche Post DHL Group, but indeed um, my home is the DHL Global Forwarding Division. Overall, um, DPDHL's carbon footprint is, is very much driven by our air freight business, but we have a large uh, of a fleet of own and subcontracted trucks. So today I'll be focusing very much on our heavy uh, duty trucking business. So in essence, we, we do a lot of things. And you can cluster our activities into two categories, which we call burn less and burn clean. So by burning less, I'm referring to activities which help us to improve our own and uh, subcontracted fuel efficiency. And this starts with driver trainings and ends with uh, the phasing out of less efficient uh, vehicles, trucks, etc. But it also means to be very mindful when you select your subcontractors to look into routing optimization, better network planning. But what is really important is also to work very closely with, with uh, the shippers, the customers, because um, by consolidating shipping uh, by shipments better, by filling the truck more, of course, uh, we can still avoid a lot of CO2 emissions or just also look into intermodal solutions. So I, I believe that there's still a lot we can do to further reduce CO2 emissions. But at the same time, it's very clear that efficiency gains are slowing down and it's very it's high time that we really moved to what we call the second s curve which is all about true decarbonization so in order to to foster our burn clean activities we're also running several activities and we have tested together with oems electric vehicles and uh, electric trucks hydrogen trucks and it's great to see that these low carbon technologies are working, they are working well. What is not uh, so great is that um, they are hardly available. It's still just tests and pilots. We need to scale them up and we need to make them available on a larger scale. And then of course, especially also when you look at uh, sustainable fuels, um, wh whenever they are available, we, we love to use them. So we invest a lot into biofuels, bio LNG, but again, availability is limited. So this is a problem. And this is, I guess, what we need to address today, how um, to accelerate the transition to a low carbon future of transport or how to really shorten the steep part of the second S curve. And of course, we've heard quite a few levers as well. And personally, I believe we will need a portfolio of, of levers um, starting from availability of low cost capital so that smaller companies can also afford to buy it um, better and um, newer equipment but also policies uh, which favor low carbon solutions would be nice like toll exemption carbon taxes but as mentioned before i come from the forwarding division so we do not own any trucks the um, any aircraft or, or vessels so for us to to foster the transition to a low carbon future is difficult and what, what we are longing for is really a mechanism which allows us to fund these new technologies but because we don't have the assets we need to fund them with subcontractors with um uh other players outside the industry but at the same time of course we need to be able to claim the co2 savings um, or reduction which um, we have been able um, to to fund so we believe there is a huge uh, potential if we could set up something like a booking claim solution something to push insetting and offsetting projects within the transport sector because we believe that this is so important we actually wrote um, a white paper together with the smart freight center about this topic i believe sophie punta mentioned that earlier today it's called carbon insets for the logistics sector and will be uh, published tomorrow so i know my time is up so um if you're interested please have a look at the white paper thank you so much Thank you, Catherine. It's impressive. Everybody's on time, so let's let's keep the let's keep the the time uh, 
carefully managed so that we get to hear more insights. And you keep you kept mentioning two words: availability and and funding. We'll we'll get to the funding question later on, but let's now focus on that availability point that you make, which is extremely important. And therefore, let's connect that to the next pan panelist. We have Andreas Follier from Scania. Scania has been a, an early supporter of the Race to Zero. So it's a pleasure to have you. And would you like to share your vision, but also respond to that question that Catherine was mentioning about availability of models and, and a perspective from the supply chain, from the supply side would be very welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you, Monica. Well, let's be honest, uh, we occupy a sector that is hard to abate and we have some serious lock-in uh, problems in the fossil system. So two years ago, we did an analysis, a deep analysis on the pathways that will take us towards a decarbonized heavy commercial transport system. And the key conclusion was that it's not only possible for us to be trans, uh, fossil free uh, in the time frame stipulated by the Paris Agreement, but it also makes a lot of sense financially on societal perspective. CO2 emissions can be reduced by over 20% only by what we call non-vehicle levers, and it's been discussed in, in, in this panel already, uh, improving routing, better load management, uh, driver efficiency, and so on. And then on top of that, of course, there are several pathways when it comes to uh, drivetrain and fuels. Biofuels we have here and now, we can scale that up and we can get a good effect right now, early 20s. And then come battery electric, which uh, according to our, our analysis is by far the most uh, cost effective. And then other technologies such as uh, fuel cell hydrogen and electric roads may also have very interesting use cases to consider and might be critical in some geographies uh, and some applications. Now, the challenge, of course, uh, that has been alluded to uh, by previous speakers is that it takes a long time to get this wide adoption of these technologies, and we don't have time. The existing stock of vehicles turns over very slowly. For our industry, it means nothing less than an unprecedented pace uh, that we need to, to go on now. Uh, I think I heard someone say that no technology shift has ever gone as fast as the technology shift that is needed to be seen in the transport sector for us to reach the Paris Agreement. If we want to be fossil free by 2050, we need to take significant steps already now by 2025. And it doesn't only mean technology. It's also new infrastructure, it's behaviors, it's new unexpected alliances and partnerships. So at Scania, with our purpose to drive the shift towards sustainable transport system, we keep ourselves accountable by setting uh, science-based carbon reduction target. And we set them well to wheel. And that means that we're setting targets that we're not uh, only can uh, take responsible for ourselves, but our clients, uh, how they power their uh, uh, transport. And this influenced everything we do. Now, I know I only have one minute. I want to just take one case that is very important for us to work together on. The key enabler for transport system that is fossil free is that we have a, a well-balanced electric grid infrastructure. And this is not a chicken or egg problem. Our customers, often small and medium-sized companies, uh, will not invest in this technology. We cannot put this cost and risk on them if there is no way for them to power their vehicles. They have to take responsibility for their business and we need to set up an infrastructure so we can power trucks on the road and on depots and on other customers. And without this, nothing uh, will happen. So that's where we need to work together. For first, first and foremost. 
Now I'll stop there and save, uh, save the rest for the conclusion. Great, thank you so much. Very clear messaging here. And that is a perfect segue into the next speaker because we have Christina Church from Lombard ODA Investment Managers. And the question of finance almost goes without saying we need finance. But we have heard already several times today that we also have to think about SMEs and, and their particular circumstances. So, Christine, it would be great if, if, if you share some remarks about the bigger question of finance, what you're seeing, what is needed. And if you have time, please uh, share some thoughts with us about SMEs. Thank you. The floor is yours. Yes, thank you, Monica, um, and a pleasure to be here. Christina Church from Lombard ODA, and I'm in charge of um, investment strategy for sustainability. And I think um, everything that all the previous speakers have said has really resonated with us in terms of the need to mobilize faster and, and how we can do that from a finance point of view. Uh, I think, uh, as, as the minister said earlier, regulation is absolutely key because investment does follow regulation. Um, we'd love to think that the investment will come first, and it sometimes does in the private sector, but to get that investment really for, for, for public companies, if there is very clear regulation stating timelines and, and that that regulation is focused on life cycle emissions, as Andreas uh, pointed out as well, you know, not just looking at tailpipe, but looking across, uh, across the uh, entire life cycle. Uh, and that, that the regulation is in the right places. You know, to date, we've seen a lot uh, in the personal vehicle space uh, and we need to see a, a lot, of, lot more move and that will help to mobilize finance if we are starting to see moves like California made. The other point is, uh, again, coming back to the point that uh, Andreas made on uh, company targets, it is very important from, from the point of view as, a, as an investor to understand where companies are positioned in, in this race to net zero. Uh, we're not wanting to look at where companies are today. We want to look at where they are for the future. And if they have science-based targets, that is very helpful uh, for the investment community to, to understand that they are therefore positioning themselves on that transition pathway. And for us, we are finding that we are still needing to do quite a lot of education with our clients when we're looking to raise uh, more money to understand what sustainability is and that sustainability is about a transition. Uh, we're not just wanting to invest today in low carbon solution providers. Those are very helpful too, but we do need to make sure that investment moves towards the hard to abate sectors, that we see uh, that the best in class companies in those hard to abate sectors, the ones that are moving fastest, the ones that are anticipating regulation before it comes, that is looking at penetration rates that are aligned with net zero, that that is where investment can come from. And of course, we do need to see a partnership uh, between governments and, and private money for, for investment. And I think it's that point that leads into to the, the point on the SMEs, Monica. We don't want to leave anybody behind. This needs to be a just transition. Um, however, from an investor's point of view and for as, as us as ad, asset managers, it is our fiduciary duty to, to generate returns for our clients. It's very helpful that today technology has come down technology costs have reduced so far that we are now seeing opportunities for investment across many different uh, areas of the sort of low carbon space. And we're seeing opportunities where electric vehicles can be profitable, certainly for uh, at the trucking end of the spectrum on total cost of ownership. Um, it's getting uh, you know, a, a lot more uh, opportunities to, for, for different technologies, whether it's hydrogen, fuel cell uh, or electric. But certainly we want to make sure that there is enough funding going across the spectrum and that when, there isn't any greenwashing in there that big companies are uh, enabling. Um, uh, the, the, the bigger companies are, are, are disclosing more, but not disclosing in the right place. And of course, infrastructure is key. I, I think that's been brought up on by most of the speakers, we do need to see investment into that infrastructure to try to help with this chicken and egg scenario of is there demand? There isn't demand because there isn't infrastructure. So I think that's a key point for us to see investment into private assets um, in infrastructure. Thank you, Christina. And while we 
uh, give some time to Doug from NG Impact. Let me ask you a very quick question because we heard this morning in a different panel from Volvo Cars that they they had this green bond. It was oversubscribed, and they are going to use it in order to finance their their shift to electric vehicles. Is there anything you would like to share with us about that? In in I'll give you. Uh, a minute because this is something that we've been getting questions about. Yes, thank you for bringing that up, Monica, because absolutely uh, we're seeing an explosion in green financing in, in, in the credit markets. And it's fantastic to see uh, sectors and, and particularly sort of traditionally harder to abate sectors take tapping into uh, green financing, whether it be via green bonds or via sustainability linked bonds, which are um, with, with targets assessed. But yes, it's great. We've seen a, a number in the automotive sector uh, coming to market, focused particularly on electrification of vehicles. We'd love to see more coming in the, in the heavy trucking sector as well. Great. So yes, so happy that there have been good news today. And since infrastructure has been mentioned several times, let's now turn to NG Impact and Doug McMahon. He is going to share some uh, ideas for how to go bigger and faster. And as we know, in, in terms of uh, long-term tracking, uh, long-haul tracking, uh, we still have uh, many, many questions about what are the optimal technologies, assuming that it's going to be a combination of battery electric and fuel cells and others. Um, what would you like to, to share with us, Doug? The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Monica. And um, a pleasure to be part of the, the dialogue today. Um, uh, I think as Rachel mentioned, you know, decarbonization of these heavier vehicle classes is still in, in very early stages. Um, NG here in the Americas is, is working on a couple of flagship projects. So we're, um, working with Anheuser-Busch to electrify 21 Class 8 trucks at the moment. And I know it's a different vehicle class, but we're also working with Santiago Chile to help them decarbonize um, uh, 6,000 bus fleet. Um, and I think there's a lot of lessons that can be kind of learned from those from a, a utility and infrastructure perspective as we um, uh, that may be relevant to you know, the race to zero emission trucking. Um, the, uh, the Brattle Group here in the US recently estimated that there's going to need to be an investment of around about 75 to 125 billion across the US um, electric power sector between now and 2030 to serve the 20 million EVs that we're expecting to have on the road. And that's going to include about 30 to 50 billion um, uh, for, for adding one to two million public uh, fast chargers and customer side infrastructure. So this really presents like a significant significant challenges and opportunities for the utility industry and infrastructure companies that are looking to help in the acceleration of vehicle electrification. So I'm just going to briefly touch on three that I think can play an integral role uh, in terms of um, class eight trucks. So firstly, and I think this, this is obviously a critical one that's been well talked about is the siting of that charging infrastructure. So again, a different um, uh, vehicle class, but Electrifying 100 buses creates the equivalent electrical footprint of the Empire State Building, okay, just to put that in perspective. So that means for an entity like the MTA in New York, who have a fleet of 6,000 buses, you're creating the electrical footprint of Midtown Manhattan in outer boroughs of, um, of New York. And that's going to place a tremendous amount of stress on the, um, the electrical grid in those areas. Now think about what that means at the Port of Los Angeles have committed to decarbonize 10,000 dredge trucks by 2035. And it starts to give you a sense of the, of the challenge ahead. The good thing is that I think there's lots of really um, innovative, um, more or less commercialized siting tools uh, that can aid with the optimal siting of charging infrastructure. But there are still various challenges and, and siting that need to be addressed. And, and the first of those is getting hold of timely, accurate local electric grid utility capacity data. Um, from which to, to model against um, vehicle traffic and charging patterns and the like. So you can start to work out where to optimally locate. The second is actually the availability of land to build this charging infrastructure, which can be particularly challenging in urban areas. Uh, and then the third is, um, is much more around kind of effective coordination uh, across developers who are looking to build that charging infrastructure on behalf of customers um, to ensure that infrastructure is being shared optimally and to ensure that we're not over or under serving um, customers in a, particular, in a particular geography. 
So that citing piece is obviously very critical. I think the second big opportunity to accelerate um, in that's kind of in the utility wheelhouse is the introduction of heavier vehicle class specific innovative utility make ready programs. So making money available for developers and utilities to offset the, the, the cost of that charging infrastructure. In the US, we've seen some really strong commitments from certain geographies, including New York and California, regarding the rate basing of public fast charging infrastructure. Yeah, most of the focus to date has been on light duty vehicles. So I'd expect the next stage would be to have um, specific mechanisms for, um, uh, for, for heavier duty vehicles. And ideally, these sorts of programs um, need to be supported by the forms of grants and incentives to ensure those least uh, able to afford decarbonisation are able to participate and draw value. The final piece, and again, I think Rachel and Andreas have touched on this um, in, in, in previous commentary, I think this is probably the most critical but complicated piece that needs to be addressed. Um, and this is where the fact that utilities, infrastructure companies and other key stakeholders, in my mind, need to move beyond focusing on setting success around simply putting steel and concrete in the ground and work with truck owners and businesses to drive down the total cost of ownership, particularly if we're going to get to cost parity between 2020 and 2025. Um, one simple way is for utilities to put in place rate structures that temporarily assist early adopters of electric trucks to help them avoid demand charges. So Southern California Edison, a West Coast utility in the US, um, have introduced an EV rate, EV9, that provides demand charge relief for trucks until 2024. So that's great. But more must be done, particularly if we're going to ensure that those who can least afford the transition are able to benefit. So you know, we're trying to advocate that these small businesses, many who have challenges with credit um, to spend $300,000 on an electric truck versus $50,000 on a Gen 3 or Gen 4 diesel truck. We're asking them to pay more in insurance and then we're asking them to change the way they operate and maintain the vehicles in an ecosystem they have no experience operating in. So not only must the entire industry come together to lower that initial total uh, cost of transition for these truck owners, we must also help them optimize operation and maintenance and take advantage of grid service revenues to offset upfront costs and share in that financial and operational risk of ownership. Thank you so much. I think you already laid out the, the beginning of our coalition here, you know, this TCO, bring down the TCO coalition, because it's a, it's a very, very common uh, challenge that we we hear about no matter the region. So I I would like to propose to the organizers that we do a a second round in in a few months with this group. So we get to to more concrete steps, and we will hear from from Wef and Angie in particular as we wrap up some concrete things she's working on. Let's go back to the point that we are in a race to zero. There is actually a campaign that you can support by endorsing a science-based target, just as Scania laid out. And next year, by about, you know, by the around 12 months from now, we are going to have a big moment, a big climate moment, that COP26 moment is going to happen in Glasgow. And what we're going to do in the next minutes is that we'll we'll give you time for some brief remarks where you would ideally mention what your company could commit to by, by COP26 and or your ask as a company from that process. So let's do that. And because we didn't have time for Q&A, we also would like you as an audience to send us your, your, your ask through Slido. As I mentioned before, you can scan the QR and the concrete question is, what key outcome, what is the, the signal that you would like to get from, or that we need to get from COP26 when it comes to the acceleration of uh, zero emission tracking? Let's do that. And while you write on Slido, uh, let's, let's just go back to our panelists. And may we start with you, Rachel? Sure, and I know we're running close Sometimes I'll be quick. I mean, one thing I, ICCG is going to be doing anyway, and I think it would be a good venue um, for at COP26 is, you know, we presented 
sort of the targets today and where we need to go. And this is something we're going to be tracking very closely over the next year. So I would really love to be able to come back and like let everyone know, you know, where we're on target, where we're, where we're not, and really what still needs to be done. So I think it's very important to constantly be tracking progress. Um, something that, of course, we'd like to see as ICCT, we work very closely with governments. COP26 is such an important and good venue for governments to be sending that extremely strong and well-messaged and sort of inline signal um, to the market of you know where they're going to be going and the policies and measures that they're going to be putting in place. So that's really something that we're going to be looking for. Thank you, Rachel. Ashish, what would you like to add? Yeah, thanks. Uh, very engaging discussion. I was making some notes. I think um, I really loved it. Um, yeah, in addition to what I already shared, uh, we are committed, uh, we have made an external commitment to achieve net zero uh, emissions as Unilever by 2039. So that stays and then we are committed to it. We'll continue to work on it. Uh, especially, specifically from logistics and zero uh, emissions trucking, uh, I see some of the things that, uh, that are pretty peculiar to us. We don't own any trucks. So we do work with our transport partners. Uh, and the TCO discussion is real. So uh, we cannot close our eyes and say that we want clean, uh, clean trucks, but it will it should be at zero cost. Uh, and we understand technologies like hydrogen fuel cell and battery electric heavy duty would come at some on cost. But how do we reduce that impact? What kind of financing options can be available along with all the regulations incentives for sure uh, to minimize this TCO impact? Because ultimately uh, our consumers are very supportive of uh, our actions but we also have to balance it uh, with the right cost. So that is one of the biggest uh, areas of focus for, for us and happy to see what we can do as an ecosystem to support that. Thank Great. You. So we heard benchmarks, we heard finance options. Let's move to Catherine and then to Andreas. Yeah, of course, uh, being an international logistics company, we like to have a level playing field. So regulation is good, but it should be on international level, of course. And then just also to speak on behalf of our shippers, I believe the private sector is very willing to help to fund um, decarbonization within the transport sector and in particular within trucking. But we need to simplify things. Right now it's so complicated. And uh, yeah, just to throw a few buzzwords at, at you, I think we need a mass, mass balance um, concept. We need book and claim mechanisms so that those companies uh, which are willing to help funding uh, a low carbon future also get um, the, the credits for it and are able to really claim the CO2 savings. Great. Andreas? Yeah, well, our pledge to COP26 is really simple. When it makes sense for our customers to invest in zero emission trucks, we will be ready across segments and across markets. Already today, customers can order plug-in hybrids and fully electric trucks for urban applications. And we have the broadest range of products can be powered by alternatives to diesel, but we will be ready on fully electric trucks when it makes sense for our customers. And it's actually a two-part pledge because the second part is that great vehicles, of course, are crucial, but we need green electricity to power them. So our second part of the pledge is that we will work with partners to make sure that our customers can power their vehicles with green energy. And of course, the most important outcome from COP26 is a clear consensus with all countries around the table this time to accelerate further to reach the Paris Accord. And then national governments can create that, uh, use that ambition to create a predictable playing field so we as businesses can go about and do what we're good at and provide the solutions. Thanks. Thank you. And thank you for your pledge. You're very welcome to join the, the champions team and tell us more about, about how you, you're planning to do this. Sure. And then let's see, now we have Christina. Yes. So for us, what we hope to be able to show uh, portfolio temperature alignment across all our portfolios so that our clients can see what temperature um, our, our, our portfolios are um, uh, against and be able to track uh, the improvement um, on achievement of the Paris uh, Accord. 
uh, we uh, also are very hopeful uh, that we will see a much tougher targets being set by by the uh, countries uh, at, at COP26, and we do want to see regulation that can push people to uh, will enforce c companies to disclose more about what they're doing, uh, not just in a financial nature, but a, a climate climate related, and in particular uh, across all scopes of emissions, including scope three. Great, and thank you for, for bringing not only the regulation, but also the disclosure. That's, that's something we, we need to normalize. And Angie, I think we were able to capture some of the Slido answers from the audience. And when we prepare some summary from this session, we will be very happy to, to share some of your, your feedback um, from the audience perspective. So with that, I would like to thank all our panelists, we are going to now move into the next uh, segment of this session. Thank you very much for joining us. And I hope to see you soon in a part two from, from this conversation. Angie, the floor is yours now. Well, thank you, Monica. And thank you all panelists. Um, we are going to be uh, now watching a short clip uh, from uh, Jerry Blumenfeld, Secretary uh, of, of the Environmental Protection of California State. Um, he will be, he's, we, we, we asked him to make some short comments just to really make sure we can motivate uh, the policymakers that leading states uh, and countries around the world can really drive um, this, uh, this, this transition that we need from, uh, from, from their, their perspective. So uh, after watching the short clip from, uh, from Jared, we will be closing the session with just some short remarks from Christiana and myself uh, as a further call to action to public and private sector who want to get uh, more deeply involved with us on, uh, on the race to zero. So here we go for the, uh, the remarks from Jared. Back in the 60s, California suffered from some of the worst air pollution in the world, and we've done a number of things. We've, um, we've innovated and we've incentivized a path towards a zero emission future. And that's particularly important now as we face our greatest threat, which is greenhouse gas emissions. Over 50% of California's greenhouse gas emissions, when you look at our profile, comes from the transportation sector. That's everything from trucks, to light duty, to medium duty vehicles. And when it comes to pollution, um, both PM, which is fine particulate matter and ozone, trucks play an oversized role as well. Even though of the 30 million vehicles we have on the road, only 2 million are trucks. They produce 70% of the nitrous oxide emissions and 80% of our harmful and carcinogenic diesel particulate matter. In the United States as a whole, Trucks are about 4% of the vehicles on the road, and they produce about 25% of the greenhouse gas emissions. And in fact, when you look at where we're going as a nation, the majority and fastest growing source of greenhouse gas emissions is this transportation sector. We all enjoy goods. They come from around the world. In the case of California, 41% of all the containerized goods, those big containers that come in ships with stuff that we love, it comes into the ports of LA, Long Beach, Oakland, and other California ports, and it goes to every single county in the United States. And the problem is that those corridors of transportation um, where all that pollution is happening generally are low income and, and communities of color. So those environmentally justice burdened communities are suffering so that we can have goods go around the country. And I think those communities have said enough is enough. We as, as a government have to say enough is enough and, and join arms with them and say, what's the solution? How do we grow the economy, promote environmental stewardship and help community health? The answer is to transition as quickly as possible to a zero emissions future. First is greenhouse gas emissions. So the Air Resources Board, affectionately known as CARB, California Air Resources Board, they uh, recently promulgated a regulation requiring truck manufacturers, the folks that make those trucks, to start selling into California zero emission vehicles, big heavy duty trucks by 2024. In addition, we came out with rules for diesel trucks today that really tighten, ratchet down the emissions that are coming from those vehicles. Governor Gavin Newsom, he recently came out with an executive order that said on the passenger vehicle side, 
all new passenger vehicles sold in California after 2035 has to be zero emission. He also pushed fleet operators and owners of big trucks to say, by 2045, you need to have in your fleets 100% zero emission vehicles. So you may have seen folks like Walmart said, we want a zero emission future by 2040. The reason that we care about this, the reason that we're leading the nation is also because we have some of the worst asthma rates in the country in places like Fresno and Bakersfield and LA because of air pollution. And so if we're going to both solve our short-term air pollution goals, stimulate the economy. So just to give you a sense, we now have 34 electric vehicle manufacturers in the state of California. The number one export from California is electric vehicles. We have more than 276,000 people working in this sector, which is five times how many we have in the oil and gas sector in California. One of the ways that we think we can work together is uh, through our collaboration with other states. How can we get best practices to, to really accelerate the progress towards a zero emission future? And of course, we want to work with all of you. And we really are excited about this opportunity to clean up the air and save the planet. Yes. So as we've heard from uh, from Secretary Blumenfeld, California is doing quite a lot to advance zero emission trucks. So building on that, 15 states in the United States have agreed to working together towards having 30% of sales uh, of new medium and heavy duty vehicles being zero emissions by 2030 and 100% by 2050. So there's quite a lot of momentum in California and in the US for zero emission trucks. And then from now on, it'll only get better. So the next step is really to align leading nations around ambitious targets for zero emission commercial vehicles ahead of COP26. We heard this loud and clear from the Dutch minister of Van and many others uh, today. So CalStart and our Drive to Zero program, we're committed to working to, towards this global alignment. We're a campaign, uh, of the Clean Energy Ministerial. We are already the support of, uh, of nine nations, including the Netherlands. So we already have a forum for this intergovernmental discussions, which will help countries to really implement the policies and incentives that are gonna be necessary uh, to meet these targets. So in addition to supporting government, industry stakeholders are also a key audience for, for Drive to Zero, which is why I'm really happy to participate uh, in the discussion today. And also, more importantly, that's why, like CalStart and, and Drive to Zero are very excited to partner closely with the World Economic Forum. So Angie, thanks for the invitation uh, to be here and uh, over to you. Thank you so much, Cristiano. And really, thank you all for your excellent speakers, uh, speaking points today. Your leadership in decarbonizing transport is incredible and really needed uh, to make sure that everybody knows this is possible. Uh, we just need to work together. It's a real privilege to be working with all of you and we look forward to more opportunities to dig into the discussion points raised um, as the opportunities will keep on coming on the race to zero and up to COP26 and beyond. So my name is Angie farag Thibault and I'm the project lead for clean trucking at the World Economic Forum. I close the session today building on a call to action. As you've heard from our first movers across the trucking value chain and the inspiring political figures represented here today, much is being done signaling readiness for radical industry transition and pockets of enabling policy environments are also stimulating these efforts around the world. For trucking decarbonization, we see this as a great jigsaw puzzle challenge to help bring these great solutions we've heard about together, test at scale and make sure the business case, policy and finance pieces fit together in the best way to really scale up and accelerate the transition this decade. As part of the Mission Possible platform, we at the World Economic Forum have launched Road Freight Zero. You heard about it a bit earlier. A coalition of leading companies and organizations working toward decarbonizing long haul road freight and infrastructure to meet net zero and just transition 2050 goals. Over the next two years, we're working in a very concrete way on de-risking vehicle finance and infrastructure developments, providing private sector input to policy discussions and co-creating new finance mechanisms with institutions such as Lombardo, Odier and others who are involved in the World Economic Forum's Transition Finance Working Group. We also see that creating synergies between leading initiatives is key to building momentum, accelerating action, and raising the bar. 
That's why we're also collaborating with several organizations, such as our great co-organizers of this event today, as well as CalStart, the Transport Decarbonization Alliance, the ICCT, the Smart Freight Center, ITF, and more, building on each other's strengths and networks. The key message is action is happening now, but we can and must do more to accelerate together smartly. As Nigel Topping said yesterday, the ripple is becoming a surge. And this couldn't be more true than in the trucking value chain where we have market readiness, growing political will and collective action mechanisms already established to capture the huge gains to be made for society in meeting clean air, environmental justice and climate goals. So we hope that you're now not only inspired, but geared up to set similarly ambitious goals to those that we've heard today and act on implementing them collectively with your value chain partners through these established platforms that we've also shared with you today. So please do get in touch and join us in this race to zero. Thank you all for listening. And thanks again to all our speakers. Have a good day.